Okay, so um, today's um, webinar is about hydrologic and hydraulic simulations with uh, river flow to the SMS. And um, I have to uh, acknowledge the collaboration of Asier Lacasta. Uh, he will not be presenting today, but he has um, collaborated quite a lot with this together with the group of the University of Zaragoza. Um, Asier is, is, um, is a developer, is a, a PhD student at the University of Zaragoza and is, is the main brain behind the river flow to the GPU. Uh, version. Uh, but today's um, contribution that he has done is about um, a stage he's, uh, he's doing at, at uh, NOAA, at one of NOAA's uh, center, and I will talk about that at the end of the uh, demonstration today. So let's get started. So the outline of the presentation uh, would be as follows. We'll talk a little bit about real flow 2 d and its component for combined hydrologic and hydraulic simulations. Um, I'll, I try to shrink as much as possible that part, the presentation part, because I want to concentrate on the actual setup simulation, uh, because I think that's a more practical part. But I, I need to do some initial presentation on the real flow 2D model for those of you who are not familiar with this tool. So I apologize for um, many of you who have been attending these webinars and know everything about real flow 2D. So uh, bear with, with me a few slides on that. Thank you. So. Um, then at, uh, after demonstration, I will talk about uh, Sierra's work on, on NOAA and what is he doing on uh, the hydrologic modeling. And it's something I want to talk about this because it's something that we uh, plan on implementing eventually in the River Flow 2D model. And of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, I don't promise I will answer during the presentation, but um, at the end I will look at the the questions of if I have uh, the chance to answer before that I will try to do it. So the River Flow 2D model um, is now a combined hydrologic and hydraulic model. Uh, is based on flexible non-structure meshes. So the meshes, as you see on the right, uh, can be adapted to very complex geometries, and that's one of the main characteristics of the model. So you can have um, vertical walls, inclined surfaces uh, of any form, and the flexibility of the mesh allows it to uh, adapt it to, to virtually any complex terrain or, or geometry. Now, with that, uh, that is not enough for to make a model a really stable and good model. And, and the real flow 2D has a very robust dry and wet bed algorithm, which is essential when you're trying to solve hydraulic problems, and particularly uh, in floodplains when you have a river that overtops levees or or gets overbank into the floodplain that is initially dry, and the, the model with flexible mesh and the algorithms that have been implemented are very efficient to handle that type of uh, situations. And the core of everything, of course, is the finding volume numerical engine. And the finding volume uh, numerical engine ensures that you have almost perfect volume conservation um, in, at the level of each triangular cell. That's very important for flooding simulations. So the model ensures um, stability, not only for subcritical regimes, which are slow velocities and very gradual flooding, but also for supercritical flows, which 
exhibit very high velocities and 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 they are very difficult to handle numerically. Now the model has been extensively validated in a very wide range of uh, real world problems. Um, there will be, and by the way, uh, let me for those of you interested, there will be a, a forthcoming webinar where we are going to focus on the validation of the model and also the comparison of the model with other models that are available out there. And we are going to announce that uh, in the next few weeks. Um, Real flow 2D is not only a hydrodynamic model, it also uh, has modules that extend its functionality to other areas. And we have a sediment transport module that is, is a very comprehensive tool to model uh, not only bed load, but also suspended load and combine suspended and bed load uh, with multiple fractions. So it's a very um, productive tool for uh, sediment uh, and erosion deposition analysis. Uh, there is a, um, a pollutant transport, the PL, the pollutant transport model that handles mul multiple pollutants. It's an, actually an advection dispersion reaction. So you can have reactions in between different pollutants. And of course, it also does the hydrodynamic simulation. And there is a, the modern debris flow uh, module for hyper-concentrated fluids. So fluids that exhibit um, uh, high uh, yield stress and they're very viscous in general. So these are all model, uh, modules that you can add on to uh, the, the main hydrodynamics. And there, there are new uh, that are coming up in the future. Um, then we have the components. The components are hydraulic structures that enhance the capability of the model to account for different hydraulic situations. And I will talk about in details about this today. Uh, the model is, is totally integrated with Aquaveo SMS GUI and is the one that we're going to be using today um, that offers a number of, of options to not only enter data uh, in a wide number of, of uh, formats, but also to visualize results. And of course, we have the GPU module or the GPU uh, version, which has been the topic of previous um, uh, webinars. But in essence, it gives you all of what the hydrodynamic model provides, but it solves the equations in a very efficient manner in GPU hardware, uh, providing accelerations that go to the order of 150 times faster than what you would have with a single core or non parallelized model. So it's a very productive tool that uh, is also available. Now the flexible mesh uh, as I said, this form of uh, exclusively of triangles, and in each triangle, uh, we calculate the water surface elevation or water depth, the two components of the velocity, and if you are running the sediment transport module with the erosion deposition, you also calculate uh, the bed elevation, ZB here. So. It's a full two-dimensional model. The, the, not all two-dimensional models are created in the same way. Uh, some of them have some restrictions on the velocities uh, that you uh, may have. This is a full two-dimensional model to solve the, the complete shallow water equations. Now, getting more into what we're going to be talking today, the hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, uh, the, the river flow 2D offers a number of components that are included in the hydro the basic version that is the hydrodynamic version uh, and also in the GPU. And one of these components is the Colbert component. It calculates the discharge based on the conditions upstream or downstream or in the inlet and outlet 
of the Colbert base on the Federal Highway Administration formulation. It can handle now circular or box square or rectangular box sections. And we are presently working on extending this functionality to more general uh, cross-section uh, culverts. Uh, this is in testing stage. This hasn't been implemented yet in the model, but this is under development. And it, allow, it will allow to model not only circular, but uh, for example, elliptical cross-sections, which are common use uh, in, in many applications nowadays. Uh, other um, very useful component is the weirs component. The weirs component not only handle uh, the standard weir, broad crested or, or other types of typical weirs, but it's used also to account for levees, sound walls, and that type of structure that create a barrier in the two-dimensional floodplain. And uh, that, that's uh, why it's very useful for urban flooding. Uh, for example, you can handle vertical walls, completely vertical walls that have different elevations and different sides of the uh, weir. And we have recently added the option to uh, represent variable crest elevations along the weir. The previous version that we had uh, accounted for a single weir crest elevation, but now the, the elevation can vary along the weir so that you can uh, represent this longer uh, um, levees or, or sound walls that have an elevation that varies along it's, it's uh, alignment. So that, that's uh, uh, new also. Um, now the bridge component was uh, introduced last year. It's, it's a bit, one of the more useful components for, for river hydraulics in urban environments. It allows for arbitrary uh, plan al alignment, uh, complex bridge geometry, free surface flow, pressure flow, overtopping, and combined situations. And what the, this component does is, is analyze the, or take into account the actual geometry of the bridge, the cross section with the deck, the, the uh, pi pillars or uh, abutments, whatever you have on, on a particular bridge. And it will take that dynamically during the the model computation to determine the head loss in that structure and account for that uh, during the simulation. So it accounts for tail water control and a lot of uh, situations that are very realistic. Uh, and it's, it's a unique feature that uh, we, we like it a lot in the model. Now, um, we also added the gates component. The gates uh, allows also for uh, different operations of typical gates uh, and a number of situations that can be handled uh, in the gate. Uh, the gate can be not working at some point. Uh, it may be flowing with free surface or with some head upstream. It can be flowing up, uh, over the, the gate itself and under it and it can be choked or or flow in these situations. So it, it covers, I would suggest all, all of the situations that are, avail, are possible in a typical gate structure. And the gate can be designed in two dimensional also in, the, in plan. So you the, design the gate uh, as a polyline, so it doesn't need to be a straight structure. So it can be a complex structure as well. Now let's start um, talking about the, the today's topic, which is the hydrologic component and how the hydrologic component interacts with the hydraulics. Uh, the way this was designed is in such a, a, a manner that the there is no distinction between the hydrologic and the hydrodynamic model. So when you want to apply the river flow to the as a hydro logic model, you 
seamlessly has the same tools that you have for hydraulics. So it's not separate model, it's an integrated model that has the tools available to account for the hydrologic features that are necessary in a hydrologic model. So in that sense, it's distributed. It's distributed model that accounts for the variations of the different parameters in space. And that's uh, applicable to the rainfall and the evaporation where you can have any uh, uh, rainfall distribution on the variation uh, varying in space and also the infiltration that can also vary in space and has different options to calculate infiltration losses. Now in the present version the infiltration is calculated as a loss so once the uh, water gets out into the soil, it will not return. So it, it's just assumed that it's a loss for, from the surface water. And we offer uh, now three different methods, Horton, Green Ant, and, and, and Crude Number. We'll talk a little bit more detail about this. Um, but you can use different methods in different areas. So if you want to, you think that you can represent better the infiltration in a steep area with uh, the green ant method, you can use that in that area. And if you have a, a, the lower watershed, maybe better represented with the curve number, you can use that in the same simulation. So you can mix and match the different methods for different areas. Now, uh, the distributed hydrologic modeling is not a simple task, it's, it's the trend. Now, uh, the, the, with the availability of these numerical methods, so as the fine volume, you get more and more uh, the, the trend tower um, distributed hydrologic modeling. But they are highly dependent on the mesh structure. And uh, our colleagues from the University of Zaragoza have published uh, papers on this topic. But one of the conclusions of, of this is that the mesh has a very important and very big impact on the results of a uh, numerical hydrolo distributed hydrologic model. So the conclusions in this particular uh, paper is that square element grids, so uh, models that use a simple grid uh, with square elements, for example, uh, generate a lot of numerical viscosity and that has an impact on the results uh, that makes the results less realistic in, in general and, and also uh, they tend to um, impose some implicit directions on the flow that are a function of the structure of the grid so uh, that's been demonstrated in the uh, paper that uh, you can see there in Journal of Hydrology. So uh, also the conclusion is that the triangular cell meshes, as the one we use in the real flow 2D model, are much better uh, prepared to solve the hydrologic equations. Now also, obviously the square uh, has some deficiencies with respect to the triangles. and. That's why we prefer the triangles. You can see here an example, and it's a very practical uh, example of an application that uh, is attempted to be done with uh, a grid-based model with square elements here and with triangles as in here. So it, this is a, a gate structure, and, and you can see here that the uh, triangular flexible mesh is very, able to resolve the flow or, or the geometry very well uh, around the different uh, tiers and things that uh, are in this structure. But the, the square elements have a, a very difficult time in, in trying to resolve this. And then this uh, irregular features that you can see here, they're very difficult and sometimes impossible to avoid in square uh, element grids. 
um, generate problems numerically and, and the results. But also from, from the memory and the performance point of view, uh, since this type of models use a single size to uh, generate the mesh, um, they force you to use the same element size everywhere. And that uh, ends up having uh, a large number of elements. For example, in this particular particular application, it's the same extent of the modeling area it requires only 400,000 triangles. Only, I would say, well, it's 400,000 is a lot of triangles, but in this square um, grid, it requires more than 2 million squares. So it's uh, a significant uh, difference that uh, also represent not only much more cells, but also um, larger computer times. Also, the results are uh, much better represented in, in triangular cells because they, the geometry is more realistic. And, and that allows the model to have a much higher detail on the in-channel hydraulics. This is a trace uh, plot that is uh, generated by the SMS user interface. Okay, so uh, the hydrologic component has a rainfall evaporation that can be uniform in space, varying in, in, in time, or spatially distributed. And, and you can add uh, any uh, rainfall input from um, the origin can be radar, gauges, uh, et cetera. It's just a matter of, of creating the, the data files in the proper format. Um, the infiltration, again, is also spatially distributed uh, with the Horton, Green Ant, or Kerr-Rumber methods. And, and I just wanted to point out that each of the methods require different data. Um, the Horton, uh, for each polygon, where you want to apply it, it requires uh, three values, three constants that are used in the Horton equation, uh, K, F, C, and F, uh, zero. Uh, Green Ant uh, is also a widely used uh, method for computing infiltration, and mainly requires the hydraulic conductivity, uh, suction the weighting front, and, and difference between saturated and initial volumetric moisture content, which are the typical values used in the in the green amp and are available in many places. Uh, curve number is very simple to use and, and the, one of the advantages, even if it's not a very um, physically based uh, model, it has been widely used in many places and has been calibrated also in, in, in many situations. So the one of the advantages is that it requires a single value that is the curve number to characterize the, the infiltration rates at each location. Um, so it, it is it is very simple to apply, and it's one of the reasons uh, is widely used and it's available here. Now, the required data that we need to run um, a hydraulic and hydrologic simulation is obviously the rainfall and evaporation. Uh, rates and these are given as time series for each polygon or each gauge that you want to add can vary in space. And these are simple tables, time series of of, of values of the rainfall intensity and the rain, uh, evaporation intensity for each time. And in the case of uh, the infiltration, uh, you also need to prepare the files for each area. And, or if it's uniform, obviously it will be only one, one file with one method. And, and these are the um, data that is required for each of the methods. So I assume we, ha we have all that data available in, in a particular application. Now, let's, um, let's jump to the actual application. I want to show you how to set up a complete model from zero using Rearflow 2D within the SMS graphical user interface. So let's um, turn to SMS. Uh, by the way, in the um, manual, 
um, in the River Flow 2D user's manual, we provide a tutorial that essentially explains step by step what I'm going to be doing today with the model. So I will open the SMS. Now, River Flow 2D supports uh, SMS 11.2. Uh, and this particular application, I'm running this in a network, so it's a network uh, environment. So this is the, the SMS interface. Uh, there are two things we need to do first, which is importing the Riverflow 2D template. So I will uh, look for the Riverflow 2D template. Is this one here. The Riverflow 2D template is what makes the link between SMS and the Riverflow 2D model. The template is a script and has a lot of information that allow, allows to translate the information that we create in SMS to the right format that we need in the Riverflow 2D model. Now, another thing that I will uh, load now is the map file. Now, the map file contains geometry information, but in this case, it's on, it only brings up some coverage that I will use to enter the data for infiltration and so forth. Now, in this case, uh, I have a rain evap. This is the uh, coverage or the layer where I will enter polygons for rainfall and evaporation. I have an infiltration layer that I will use to enter the polygons for infiltration parameters. And there are two layers here for wind and manning sand that I will not use in this tutorial, but they are used for uh, inputs of variable wind on the water surface and variable mannings. So this is the, the, the main um, the main uh, layer structure. I will add more information as required. For example, uh, one of the first things we need is the uh, terrain elevation. This is basic for all hydrologic and hydraulic information. SMS has a number of uh, options to import different formats. Um, the format I'm using here is an XYZ, but there are many others. And the elevations are in this file. Now, this is a real project. What I'm showing to you is a project that uh, is being done to the, the Inter-American Development Bank. And it's a funding for uh, doing some um, simulations in Haiti, in Northern region. So I will use the import wizard. Now, the Import Wizard is a very flexible tool available in SMS that um, allows to enter different formats for files. And I will here skip the first line that has some information that I don't need. So it's essentially an XYZ, uh, XY, and the uh, elevation here. And it's a space separated. So. I can filter to the data if necessary, but I'm not doing that today here. So I'm importing like uh, 300,000 points or so here. And I will use the rendering options in SMS to uh, visualize the elevations points. Now, this is the elevation the terrain elevation. You see here there are points. If you zoom in close enough, there are points uh, that represent the terrain elevation. So this is our basic uh, terrain information. Uh, I would need to check the projection. And the reason I should always check the projection is that when we are doing uh, export, of results to, for example, um, Google Earth, we need to be in the right projection in order to represent the results in Google Earth correctly. 
So I will make sure that the um, projection I'm using is the right one. And in this particular case for Northern Haiti is UTM 18. This is the, the area that uh, we are covering here. And the uh, datum is uh, WGS 84. So this is the projection I uh, will be using for uh, this particular application, and it will allow us to represent the results in Google Earth at the end. Okay, so we have already the elevations now. Um, what we need to do is to create the boundary of the mo model that we want to have here. Now we'll use this uh, our creation tool to create different arcs that delimit the area I want to model. So I will create the more or less approximate uh, polygon uh, like this. I create different parts because I we use this to uh, add different boundary conditions to the polygons. So let me see, I will now uh, build polygons. Okay, I have the polygon selection tool. I will add the attributes to this polygon, indicating which scatter set or elevation data set I want to use for that particular polygon. Okay. And I will redistribute the vertices here because the redistribution in SMS of the vertices in the external polygon and also the internal ones is what will guide the mesh generation engine to create the elements inside. So what I'll do is select all the external polygons uh, or polylines and uh, redistribute the vertices and I will use 100 this is in metric so it's 100 meters so I will use a relatively coarse mesh so you see all the vertices have been redistributed and that will help uh, to create the mesh inside with elements that are more or less 100 uh, uh, meters in size. Now, now we're here in the mesh layer uh, or or this map data layer, let me uh, click here to create boundaries that are outflow boundaries because this is the downstream side of the watershed. So I will use this to uh, create a boundary condition that is an external boundary condition. I have a number of options and one of them is free outflow. So I will use free outflow in this part of the boundary and also on this side here because there may be flow that is approaching this area as well. So this is an exterior boundary, also free flow or free outflow and click OK. So now we have the conceptual model, we have the elevations, we have the, uh, the external polygon that we want to use with redistributed vertices and the boundary conditions as well. This is the, the, the best way to proceed here because once we generate the mesh, then the mesh will capture all the information that we have from the boundary conditions that are created in the map uh, data uh, layer. So um, if we generate now the mesh, let, let's do it here. If we click here, and use the map to, to the mesh. Now the mesh is generated and we can use the render or display option tool to create um, colors based on the elevation of each cell. So now we have the mesh. Uh, and the mesh can be also viewed in uh, 
uh, 3D. If you want to look at that, uh, you can see the mesh and zoom in in 3D quite easily with the tools that are available in SMS. So we have the mesh. Uh, we could do a simulation now if we uh, enter additional boundary conditions, but we don't have rainfall or infiltration. So the first thing I want to do is to uh, create a, a rainfall polygon. Now, the way to create the rainfall polygon is to do it in the rain evaporation layer here. So I will create a rainfall polygon. I will assume that I have, oops, to be in plan view. So I will create a polygon here. Now this polygon, um, let me turn off the mesh. This polygon is where the gauge or the time series of rainfall intensity will be applied to. So over this area, I will have rainfall defined by a time series. And the idea here is that you can have a file with the time series associated with this particular polygon. You can have as many polygons as you want. So you can have a squares or any polygon. You can also import, for example, the polygons from a shape file and use the shape file as the base to do this. I'm just using the simplest, simplest way to just enter a polygon here. Now, one important thing is not forgetting to build the polygons. So here, uh, I have built the polygons, and this tool is activated. And I will associate here an attribute that is a material. Now, you see here, I have the materials, in this case, represent the, the file name corresponding to the time series I want to associate to this rainfall area. I have pre-entered the materials for this or the um, name of the files is rainfall1.dat. You see here I have also created parameter files already for the infiltration and, and different uh, infiltration methods here. So let's associate now the material rainfall1.dat to this particular polygon. Now, something that is also very important is that if you look at this polygon, not all the points are the same. Some of them are nodes, which are represented by these large dots, and some of them are vertices. They are treated differently in SMS. So one essential thing you need to do here is to select all the vertices and I have selected them, all of them here, and convert them to nodes. It's very simple. You just select it and right click and use convert to nodes. And now all the um, points representing the polygons are nodes. These are not nodes of the mesh. These are nodes of the layer. So don't get confused by that. It has nothing to do with the, with the mesh that we are going to be using. The polygons representing the rainfall are totally independent from the mesh itself. So um, once we have that, we can save the project. Let's call it Haiti 1. OK. Now um, we can, um, we need to make sure that let me, let me see here. If we try to run this in this way, um, we will get a message indicating that the data files corresponding to the rainfall are not in the proper folder because I, I didn't put it there. So let me show you what you will get if you try to run the model in this way. So let's try to run the model with rainfall. I haven't added infiltration yet. So if we 
I want to run the model with rainfall only. Let's use this here. Let's put here six hours. Okay. Let's put output every one hour. Uh, forget about the steady state anyway, it will be on steady with rainfall. And the rainfall infiltration option, you see we have four options. Uh, turn off, no infiltration, no rainfall. Or rainfall with without infiltration, infiltration without rainfall, or both together. So we have all the options here. Let's use the first one here, rainfall without infiltration. So now we can run the model, save. And you see here that uh, the rainfall one data file that we want to associate with the polygon wasn't found. So it tells us where to locate that file. And the idea to do this in this way is that you, typically these files are created externally and not generated by different programs. So the idea is that you have this database in a folder and you just need to point the folder to the appropriate uh, location. So in this case, what I will do is, is, is simple. I'm just copying the files to the same folder where I have the project, which is Haiti one Rearflow 2D Mesh. And these are my data files here. So now, uh, if we attempt to run the model again, so the model will run, we'll find the files, and it's running with rainfall and evaporation only. We haven't added any uh, infiltration, but you can see here that the rainfall was originated in this area, and then it flows down whatever path it finds. So you don't need to define or predetermine the channels or ways where the, the flow will go, just flowing by the runoff is automatically generated by the topo uh, that, that you have selected. So let's stop it here. Okay, so let's look at the results. One of the ways uh, of looking at results is by importing the result file, the HDF5 file. Now this file is very flexible because it loads all the results you may have. And in this case, these are the plotting options you have. You can plot depth, or you can plot food numbers, uh, shear stress. And you see here, you have the units. Uh, these are in meters. If you had uh, run the model in English units, you would get the appropriate units uh, represented here as well. Uh, but look at this. This is new because now you have an uh, a rainfall plotting and you can plot the accumulated rainfall in cubic meter per cell. So you can get plots of how much, uh, what's the volume that has been accumulated per cell. And, and that's a useful um, result that in some applications. You need to know the, the water balance uh, and you get that information, not only globally, but also spatially. So as you see here, there is no information about infiltration because you know, we're not modeling infiltration. When we model infiltration, we'll see that you get the uh, accumulated infiltration volume as well. So, um, and, and you have different times here. I will show you later how to generate animations. Okay. So for now, uh, let's um, go back to, let, let me remove this results here. We'll add more later. Now that we have the rainfall uh, polygon, I would like to add a infiltration. So, um, if, if we wanted to add infiltration uh, to, to the model, 
what I want to do is, in the same way we're doing that with the rainfall, we can have multiple polygons representing the different infiltration areas here. So I will add here one polygon on this area here. This is a very crude, it's just to show you how to do it in, in, in simple, Oops. in a simple way. So we have one infiltration area, and if we don't define any polygon here, this will be assumed to be impermeable. So it's very important to, uh, if you want to model infiltration, to cover the whole area with, uh, with infiltration polygons here. So I will, I will leave it as that, that to show you the, the implications that it will have. So, and in the same way that we uh, did with the rainfall, here we need to do feature objects, build polygons, associate this polygon with its attributes, which is the file, the infiltration, corresponding infiltration file. I will use infiltration one. It's a pre-created pre file with the parameters uh, for the Horton method, in this particular case. I will show you how to build these files in, in, a, in a few minutes. And, and now again, remember, vertices to nodes. So you click here, select all, right click, convert to nodes. So we have all nodes here now in the infiltration Layer. One thing that is important, you should not change names of this infiltration and rainfall layers. They are hardwired. You change them, the model will not be able to find the polygons or recognize the polygons correctly. Okay, so uh, let me, I will delete the, everything just to make sure I have everything correctly transferred to the new uh, mesh. I will remesh everything and now when I enter the parameters let me use here six hours again one hour output and in the rainfall infiltration tab I will use rainfall and infiltration as the option to model okay I want to consider rainfall and infiltration so now, when I run the model, now you see that the model reported that the local infiltration file was read. And now the results should represent not only the, the rainfall, but also the infiltration. So if we stop here, And now open again, results, as we did before. You see that now we have not only the accumulated rainfall, but accumulated infiltration. And you see that the accumulated infiltration is not shown here because this is impermeable. So it should, it should be uh, evident from where we have the parameter, the, the this polygon here defined. So we only have infiltration on the area that we define as the infiltration parameter as where it's all uh, assumed to be impermeable. So this is accumulated rainfall. It varies in, in time, as you see here. The accumulated infiltration follows more or less the uh, area, the flooding area. So this is the infiltration volumes different locations and these are the, the flow depths. So we have a, a number of other ways to look at the results but these are just the, the, the main one. I just wanted to show you how to make animations and um, if you want to see an animation of this plot, let's say you want to plot the depth, um, you use the 
the display options dialog. I don't want to look at the nodes. I don't care about the mesh anymore. So I will turn off all the features except for the contours. And in the contours, I want to make it a little transparent so that the when we plot it in Google Earth, we can see through and, and we can see the, the underground surface as well. So, or, or, the, or the, the terrain surface, I'm sorry. So let's put a um, value of, uh, of 50 here, transparent, and click OK. So let's, I don't want to look at the infiltration polygons. So now we have the depth but there, you see, there are little, uh, there is a transparency evident here. Now, to do animations, what you do, you go to the data uh, menu and you use the film loop. There are two main ways to create animations. One is creating an, a standalone AVI file, which is a, a well-known format for animations or you can create uh, Google Earth KMC files, or both, as, as now. So um, let's create a KMC file. Next, let's accept all the defaults. And the uh, plots are created, and automatically, you, you get a call to, if you have installed the Google Earth, uh, it will go directly to the area. This is Haiti, Northern Haiti. And it will load the animation here, all the values. You see this, this plot indicates that the, because KMC is a compressed format, so until you don't get all the files loaded, you will get this um, weird, arrow tools that indicate that the animation is, is loading. So you see the animation exactly over Google Earth. You can look at that in, in 3D. You can use all the tools that you are familiar with in, in Google Earth. Uh, make as any representation of uh, the same thing you can do with uh, with vectors or, or any of the other variables that you have uh, available in in SMS. So I have a, a, a different, for example, I have a previous thing I was doing when I was preparing uh, the webinar. I have another uh, longer simulation here. Oh, unfortunately, it's, it's not loaded, uh, but. Uh, you, you have a lot of flexibility by adding the, the Google Earth tools uh, to uh, visualize results. And, and one of the advantages of, of this tool is that with a single file that you create with KMC file, you can send it to your client, you can send it to your colleague, and they can look at the animation uh, very simply, you just having Google Earth, they don't need to uh, have SMS or Reflow 2D or anything. So they can they can look at the results, look at the, any 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 detail that you wanted to show them with annotations and, and so forth. So as you see, uh, you know, even though the the uh, Reflow 2D is a very comprehensive model, they have a lot of tools. Uh, using them is is not difficult, this is very straightforward, very intuitive, and it's very easy to create an application as we have done today from star uh, to finish. So um, I will answer some questions, but uh, let me um, let me first uh, finalize the, the last part of the presentation with um, a summary of the work that uh, Sierra Lacasta is doing with, with NOAA in the stage she's having uh, in the NOAA um, National Weather Service North Central Forecast Center uh, near uh, Minneapolis. And the what 
is essentially doing is implementing the Sacramento model. And Sacramento is is a kind of hydrologic model. It's a model it's called the soil moisture accounting model. It's a it's a model that accounts for infiltration uh, in, in, a, in a very practical way, but in a way that has been proven to work in many different environments. And that's one of the reasons that is used so widely across NOAA uh, and, and the National Weather Service, particularly in the United States. So what ASIER has been doing is implementing this in a GPU platform. And, uh, and the reason th that he's uh, interested in doing this and NOAA is very interested in, in, in supporting this is that uh, they need to provide uh, forecast in a very short time. And in this particular case, the, the Sacramento model was developed to generate real forecast in watersheds with response time of less than 12 hours. And the, the lead time for the forecast is even smaller than that. So uh, the ongoing development in this regard uh, it's all about the, the Sacramento model that accounts for precipitation, evaporation, temperature. So you have you enter full series of, of temperature uh, and precipitation, and the model calculates uh, based on the on the soil type and on, on two layers that you discretize the soil with the soil within. Uh, it determines the uh, the inflow into the soil. So uh, these are some results that um, I find quite impressive uh, that uh, represent, you see on the animation here, you have the, the actual precipitation forecast based on radar uh, information. And what you see there is the runoff in the, in the lower uh, file. And this is generated by the, the program that uh, Sierra has been working on. Now, more impressive than that, I think, is the acceleration that he's getting with the GPU version. So he has recoded everything and used the CUDA with NVIDIA Tesla cards to develop the code in a very efficient way. And you can see here the, the, the timings with one core GPU. These are times, but this is a log. Well, this is log log, but this is log time of, of time in seconds. So you see here that the acceleration are order, several order of magnitudes. Uh, so you, you get much, much faster results with the GPU. And, and that's why we are convinced this is a feature and we're trying to implement all of these tools. Uh, and eventually this will see its way to a real flow to the, because the, uh, the idea of the National Weather Service, particularly this, uh, North Central uh, Forecast Center is to implement river flow to the as an operational model inside their day-to-day the -day, uh, forecast operations. Um, okay, so let's um, let's uh, turn to some questions. Uh, I have quite a few here. Um, let's um, try to go over them as. Uh, quickly as I can. Uh, okay, so uh, um, well, first question is possible to uh, get the uh, SMS for educational license of Rio Flow 2D. Yes, uh, yes. All all of the features that we have in River Flow 2D and SMS are available in the educational license. Now there is. The educational license, or the academic license, as we call it, is it has a 50% discount over the normal license. But it's more than that because it actually offers virtually unlimited use on a classroom environment or a, or a lab environment. So you, what we do is we we provide as many licenses as you would need with password, so your students are able to use the, li the, the license um, in full, okay? Now, there is a free license that is totally free, 
not necessarily for classroom or, or academic, but it is limited to 2,000 cells only. It has full features, but only limited to 2,000 cells, and it's only also temporary. It's not a permanent license that with SMS. Um, okay. Uh, let me read it because it's long. For one of the results, I saw sheer stress. That's interesting. Uh, can that be used to a certain potential damage of, of a structure that come? Uh, okay. Based on structure strength. Well, yes, but what you can do, you can do more than that. Actually, you can not not the shear stress, but the you can create in SMS. You can create new results based on the model results. So let's say you want to create an impact force result. That is not directly a, an output of the model. The model does not calculate impact force. But the impact force is typically a function of the water depth, velocity, uh, etc. It can be, it can have another uh, uh, another parameters there. Now in SMS you can create a new variable out of the existing results that could be the impact force based on the formulation you want and then plot it. So that that's an option that, that you have uh, that is very useful for that's also useful for creating hazard maps for example and that type of thing that are not directly available in the model. By the way the, the the model is able to to it also I didn't show it because I didn't have too much time but then since uh, I get the question uh, you you can also plot the maximum values you have uh, together with the time varying values here you can, you have the maximum results file and this maximum results have a larger set of of, of uh, parameters for example inundated time how long each area is inundated with with a certain. Let me. Oops, sorry. Let me remove this. So you have uh, inundated time. So you have you have here. This area has was inundated five hours. This was, an inundated over a depth of ten centimeters. The maximum bed elevation, maximum depth, maximum velocities. Uh, how long does it take to reach uh, a, a 30 centimeters, uh, one meter peak, and hazard. So we have hazard maps based on USBR, uh, USB reclamation, but you can have different hazard methods implemented very, very easily. Okay, uh, let's, we have a few minutes more, so let's continue with the questions here. Of, uh, different formats that can be used to read elevation data? Well, uh, a lot of them, you can read uh, uh, DM, you can read VWGs, you can read uh, DXF, uh, LIDAR, etc. ASCII files, shape files, there, there are many of them. SMS provides a wide variety of, of files that you can use to read data into Either scatter sets, or you can read it in in layers and then convert it to scatter sets, uh, and so forth. So um, it, it depends on the on the format that you have available. There, but there are many of them that that you can use to to import in in SMS. Um, okay. Uh, it's, Question about there's a lecture on dam break analysis. We have a forthcoming webinar on that. We did one last year, and we will have one uh, in a in a few weeks, probably a month or so. Uh, Um, there is a question here about whether to use infiltration in every simulation. Well, there are some simulations where infiltration is not a critical um, phenomenon that you want to simulate. Um, 
in theory, you could, you know, if you wanted, you could uh, incorporate any, you know, in any simulation. It's not necessary for for flooding. Uh, it's probably not necessary unless you want to look at the how long does it take to infiltrate the water in the in the floodplain. But you have the tool there. It, that's an engineering uh, a judgment uh, question, I guess. Um, okay, uh, there is a question here. My company has a license and has been using Argus One. Um, no, well, the, the question is if they need to uh, acquire a new license to get SMS hydrologic model. No, no, no. That this this tool is available for Argus One as well. You don't need to have a new license. You just need to be, you know, we we don't. In uh, the, the the way we provide upgrades, we don't we don't sell upgrades in Hydronia. We just have the subscription. So you have, um, if you are updated, if you are up to date in your subscription, you you should um, send an email to support or sales, and just ask for the um, update, and you get the files automatically. I mean the updated files for Argus One as well. Um, can the model results be displayed in ArcGIS? Yes. Yeah, the model can output, um, for example, shape files. Um, let's see. Well, I don't recall where, but but you can you can uh, you can output results as. Um, uh, There is a tool here. They change it from uh, version 11 to 11 to I don't recall where they put it now, but yes, the, the answer is yes. You can output results in in shape files and import it then in um, RGIS. Uh, it's possible to refine the mesh, of course. Yes, yes, you can refine the mesh in many different ways. Um, uh, for instance, you. Uh, if you let me um, let me remove this mesh, and if you want to refine the mesh, um, say on an area here, what you would do is to create here uh, for this. Um, we used to do the vertices for this particular, let's say you want elements here that are uh, 20, 20 meters here, and you want also, you have a river here, I don't, I don't know if you have a river here, but let me, let me assume you have one, and then uh, you want also elements here that are 20 meters. Oops. I'm not sure if they uh, let's re-speed it again. 20, yes. Okay. So what you do is just uh, remesh. So the, what the, it will happen is that the mesh. Let me let me make it evident because the elements are I didn't. Uh, show it here. So if you look at the elements now, you see the refinement that is done on the areas that I selected. It's, it's clear here. So yeah, you can. There are many ways to refine the mesh and and adapt it to to any uh, geometry. Uh, well, unfortunately, I, I ran out of time. I have a few other questions that I want to answer by email. Um, but I, I wanted to thank you all for the attendance today. We, we had a, quite a large crowd, and I appreciate your interest. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, feel free to email us uh, at support at hydronia.com or personally. I, I'll be happy to answer any questions at reyray at hydronia.com as well. And again, the webinar. Uh, 
uh, is being recorded, it will be made available to all of you. And you are free to offer them to your uh, colleagues as well. Okay, thank you. Have a great day.